Welcome back, guys. We got more oversimplified today. Yeah, I've been enjoying these. They're so educational, but in a broken down, easy to understand and fun way. Yeah, and like you said, a comedic way that's a little more digestible in short doses. I know some of you guys are saying it doesn't cover everything, and that's like you were saying, to be ex expected in an oversimplified video. But um, I think it's cool because there's so many different topics that we can go through, right? We've done the World War II yep. and Cold, Cold War, War videos. And, you know, we didn't need to sit through an entire history class to get at least some the background basics, on it. Right? Yeah. And if we yeah. want to dive deeper into these things, we can, which is really cool. But yep. you're not going to know anything at all if you don't get a simplified version of oh, it. So to expect that they're going to throw everything in here is, is unrealistic. I would say, um, or you'd be here all day. Yeah. But that said, they may leave out important points that are key. And I think some of the commenters are saying that in the last video that we did with the cold war, you were alluding to, um, you know, some presidential speeches or some, uh, policies that were set that may have, been important that were left out in the video in influenced the chain of events yeah. so anyways it was informative for us mostly because we're not american and we don't know a yes. ton about american history and that was obviously representative in the cold war right it was all about yeah. america essentially Which will and, also and, be true for today Russia, well. right? so yeah and this one the american civil war we do not know a whole lot about this other than it is basically the north and the south and to do with slavery so yeah. um that's kind of our baseline and now we're going to get exposed to a much much more of something yeah. that happened about 160 years ago yeah so Long time ago now you ready i'm ready let's roll okay mrs lincoln this is it one last push and we're done <clears throat> Nine months and four days ago, my father brought forth upon my mother himself and gave to her a child conceived in a shack in Kentucky and dedicated to the proposition that I will drink num nums from a bottle and do little poo poos in my pants for the next two to three years. Now, what does it babies do again? Oh, yeah. I. I'm not touching that. Interesting start. Abraham Lincoln grew up with his relatively poor family in Kentilly Poor Family in Kentucky, eventually moving to Indiana and finally Illinois. He read a lot of books, worked a lot of jobs, wrote some questionable poetry, and finally entered the law profession. Despite being self-taught, he turned out to be a pretty clever and astute lawyer. In one case, a guy claimed he witnessed a murder at night, and Lincoln was like, how could you have seen anything in the dark? There was a bright full moon. A what? A bright full moon. Can you say that again, please? There was a bright full moon. A dim half moon? No, a bright full moon. That's funny, because according to this almanac, there was a dim half moon that night, which makes you a liar. Uh, well, well I got a bright full moon for y'all right here. Now that's what I call a rebuttal. <laughs> Lincoln and his cheekbones weren't only interested in law, however. He also dabbled in the world of politics, serving as a legislator in both local and national assemblies. And what a time it was. Not even a hundred years after the founding fathers wrote, all men are created equal, politicians were already asking, yeah, but what does that mean exactly? It means all men. Yeah, but what does that mean exactly? And not just that. States' rights versus the federal government. What are the executive powers of the president? Is cereal a soup? The founding fathers left some of these questions perhaps a little too open to interpretation. And the biggest question of them all was slavery, an ugly mark on what should have been a revolutionary new nation based on liberty and democracy. Thomas Jefferson had written a condemnation of slavery in the Declaration of Independence, but out of fear of losing Southern states' support, it was removed. Hey guys, do you think leaving this a little vague will create any unforeseen problems in the future? Cannonball! And those unforeseen problems were now beginning to rear their ugly heads. As the nation developed, the North and the South developed along two very different lines, and two very different cultural identities emerged. Northern cities began rapidly industrializing, while the Southern climate allowed for large plantations of labor-intensive crops. As a result, one half of the country didn't rely on slaves, while the other half had become economically dependent on them. In 1793, Eli Whitney's cotton gin caused the slave trade in the South to explode. While in the North, a growing abolitionist movement was taking root, a general mistrust began to develop between the North and the South. 
As Northerners felt the South were hell-bent on expanding slavery and fear spread throughout the South that the North wanted to take their slaves away. In 1819, there were 11 free states and 11 slave states. A perfect balance, a happy medium, a harmonious relationship. Hey guys, nice to meet you. I'm Missouri, and I would like to become the 23rd state. Hey buddy, welcome to the nation. We'll be happy to accept you as a free state. Oh no, you don't. You're trying to get one over on us. Missouri's gonna be a slave state. Okay, listen, why don't we just ask Missouri what it wants to be, and we slave state. Well, then, uh, allow me to introduce to you the newest, freshest state on the scene, Maine. Hey, you can't do that, and you can't have any more slave states above this line. What? The issue of slavery is solved, and it will never come <laughs> up again. A few years later, it came up again. You see, as America expanded westward, each new state or territory that was added threatened to upend the delicate balance between the slave and free states. If one faction managed to outnumber the other, it could gain an easy majority and force its own ideals on the opposing side, leaving a huge portion of the population feeling spiteful and oppressed. For a while, compromises kicked the can. It's really interesting to see the beginnings mm -hmm. of where this started from. Yeah. And I never even processed or thought about the impl impact that it had on the governmental process. Yeah. Right? So what they're highlighting there is that they couldn't have a majority between non-slave and slave states because if they allowed it to get out of hand, then the voting rights of those states would impact the way the constitutional process would work. Yeah. So it was like... <laughs> You know, neck and neck and, and back and forth yeah. right from the very beginning that they're highlighting here. But I never processed that at all, like that it would have had an impact not only on the people and the, the ideas within the states, but also from the whole country. Mm -hmm. Right. And the unity yeah. or lack thereof mm -hmm. from the country as a whole yeah, and how that sure. would have then pro went into the governmental process to politicize and polarize that idea so yeah you know now i'm starting to conceptualize what it would have and looked see like see why there's also so much separation now as well yeah. it's linked into today wrote and kept the volatile balance in check as new free and slave states were roughly added in pairs but then one loudmouth state just had to barge in and ruin everything as usual <laughs> the addition of texas saw the united states enter into a war with mexico which they won gaining a huge amount of land out west and creating even more problems Hey guys, nice to meet you. I'm California, and I would like to become the 31st state. Hey buddy, welcome to the nation. We'll be happy to accept you as a southern slave state. Oh no, you don't. You're trying to get one over on us. California is going to be a free state. Okay, listen, why don't we just ask California what it wants to be, and we can free state. Well, then, uh, allow me to introduce to you the territories of New Mexico and Utah, able to freely vote for slavery themselves. Hey, you can't do that. And we can enter Northern Territory anytime we want to recapture escaped slaves. What? The issue of slavery is solved and it will never come up again. A few years later, it came up again. In 1854, a Democratic senator from Illinois wanted to build a really cool choo-choo train here and proposed that the territories of Kansas and Nebraska be created open to slavery, even though they were clearly above the Missouri Compromise Line. Obviously, the northern states were like, hell no. But the southern Democrats who controlled Congress at the time were like, well, if you love liberty and democracy so much, then you should let them vote on whether slavery should be legal or not. And so it was. Huge numbers of pro and anti-slavery settlers rushed to Kansas to sway the vote in their favor. And while they were all there, they began to beat the crap out of each other. One of those settlers was a man named John Brown, a former businessman who failed at just about everything he tried and went arguably insane. He was a radical abolitionist and dedicated much of his life to the Underground Railroad and freeing slaves. One night, in revenge for an earlier raid by pro-slavery forces, he and his sons killed a number of pro-slavery settlers in the territory, helping to kickstart years of violence known as Bleeding Kansas. Kansas and Nebraska both eventually it. voted in favor of outlawing slavery. But from here, the tension began to grow at a rapid pace. In 1852, author Harriet Beecher Stowe penned Uncle Tom's Cabin, a best-selling novel that exposed the terrible cruelty of slavery to the world. Oh, how awful. How morally corrupt a nation must be to allow such things to happen. Your Majesty, what should we do about all the starving children working in the coal mines? Nothing! In 1854, the Republican Party was formed, and Abraham Lincoln emerged as a leading figure. Southern Democrats viewed the new Republican Party with mistrust, believing it to be radical and abolitionist. In 1856, a politician named Charles Sumner gave a speech in Congress, calling out slave-owning Democrats with fiery language. If slavery was a woman, she'd be an ugly one, and the senator from South Carolina would like to boink her. Representative Brooks, do you have a rebuttal? 
Oh, I have a rebuttal, all right. Yeah, here's a rebuttal for you. Oh, come on. Surely this isn't allowed. Hmm, I don't know. I'll have to consult the rulebook. Hmm, I can't find anything about caning a political opponent. But it says here I'm not allowed to wear women's underwear. <laughs> Uh-oh. News of the violence on the Senate floor took the nation by storm. Southern slave owners sent Representative Brooks new canes to replace his now broken one. And on the floors of Congress, politicians carried weapons in self-defense, which is never a good sign. In 1857, the Supreme Court ruled in the Dred Scott case that all people of African descent, slave or free, could not be citizens and therefore could not sue for their own freedom under any circumstances, undoing years of progress with the strike of a gavel. Now, within all this bitter debate over slavery, there were many nuances. North versus South, Republican versus Democrat, states versus the federal government. But let's strip hmm. all of that away. For 4 million individuals living in America, this wasn't about political intrigue or party alignment. It was about the basic human right to be free. Men, women, and children were stolen from their homelands and brought to the American continent, where for generations they were considered to be property, forced to live in poverty, and work from sunrise to sunset. Plantation overseers did whatever they felt was necessary to get the most out of their slaves. Punishments were often barbaric. Families were regularly separated, and parents could often only watch, as their children were auctioned off, never to be seen again. Thousands of slaves took the treacherous risk of running away, and abolitionists in the North helped many escape via the Underground Railroad, as bounty hunters entered the North to chase them down. The North Leading North. figures within the abolitionist movement included many significant free black men and women. But it's important to note that for many of the anti-slavery white individuals in the North, opposition to slavery was often an economic issue, not a moral one, as many worried large plantations would take their lands and livelihoods away. Abraham Lincoln knew that slavery was a moral evil, and he regularly spoke out against it in... So there's a lot to, to digest and unpack in that, right? I mean... Uh... Uh, that's what I was thinking as he was going through this is that it was largely seemingly an economic related issue yeah. uh, that, you know, people were making money off of slaves in the South yeah. from the labor and, you know, yeah. that was their livelihood and that's why they didn't want to give up on slavery, right? Yeah, and because then they would have to start paying people to do the work, exactly. which would cut into their profit margins. E and exactly. And in the North, the way that it was industrialized didn't rely so much on that and so they had less of an incentive to want to have people doing uh, cheap labor, right? And... So, I mean, that highlights a lot of, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, it obviously it's heartbreaking to know that people had to experience what they experienced. Right. And, you know, that's what they were highlighting there mm -hmm. is that within all of this, within the economic stuff that I just mentioned within the political spectrum as well, because even within that you, if you unpack that, you have constituents, right. That, you know, the political leaders are then arguing to seek power and they know they're going to get power from constituents. So they make their arguments based on their own political gain mm -hmm. rather than the moral aspects that they're just getting to with Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. So there's so many nuanced little things that affect, the outcome in a larger respect right and even uh, they had mentioned in there um that uh, they were the people that became slaves african americans were taken from other continents. stolen from uh, another con continent and i've also you know dove a little bit deeper into that and from what i understand it was a lot of african uh, people that were then selling Africans to people in, in the, the South US, to yeah. do the slave labor. So it was their own people that were selling, selling their them. own people again for economic and and gains yeah. that they were going to receive. So what it highlights, I think, is that each individual along this step and along this process is putting their own gains ahead of the people that were suffering and shouldn't have been. Yeah. And it's not, I think, so much as, you know, um, uh, you know, a hatred for a specific culture of people. It's what's in it for me yeah. at each individual level. Just people being selfish. Yeah. And so that has, but it's crazy that that blew up into this whole yeah. ordeal of, 100%. like I said, Republican, Democrat, uh, you know, North and States South. States versus federal. Exactly. And we haven't even really got to the state uh, versus federal so much. I think, you know, we, they, we've touched on it, but it's as you, you know, you look at it and to where we are today, it's still like state versus federal are still 
ongoing. Yeah. And it tells you that the legislation process is just obviously very imperfect and it contributes to uh, maybe not the best outcome for people within it and it's more for the individual gain. Yeah, for sure. And it's also like just to visualize, um, cause you sometimes forget that the whole Western side of the U S used to be Mexico. Yeah. I, yeah, I was really un unaware of how that yeah. came to be. And then it's like, you know, like that used to all be like California, Texas, all yeah. of that used to be Mexico. Right. And then now it's the States. So, you know, it's like, I, you never really think about like, Oh, all that land came from Mexico. Yeah. Abraham Lincoln knew that slavery was a moral evil, and he regularly spoke out against it in powerful speeches that helped him rise through the ranks of the new Republican Party. He lamented at the hypocrisy of a great American nation meant to stand as a shining beacon of freedom while also enslaving four million men, women, and children. He most famously declared in 1858 that a house divided against itself cannot stand, that one day slavery in America would end. However, even Lincoln was cautious in his opposition. He didn't want to outlaw it entirely, but simply prevent its expansion so that given enough time, he believed it would naturally die out. Thankfully, history would force his hand. In October 1859, one abolitionist decided he'd try to single-handedly take down slavery by force. Who would be crazy enough to even attempt such a thing? Ah, it's our good friend, John Brown. He planned to seize arms from an armory in the town of Harper's Ferry, free the slaves there, and continue south, inciting a major slave uprising along the way. A noble cause, a bad plan, and terrible execution. Brown's men took the armory and some hostages, but were quickly surrounded by one Robert E. Lee and his U.S. Marines. Brown was captured, and a couple of months later, he was executed for treason. Northerners sympathized with Brown, but Southerners were like, you see this? They're coming for us. Soon, there'll be a million John Browns. A million John Browns? What on earth are you thinking about? A John Brown farm? Yeah, me too. To make matters worse, new northern free states meant now the southern states really were outnumbered, and they were beginning to feel bitterly spiteful and oppressed. Further fear began to spread in the south when news broke that a relatively unknown figure had just secured the Republican Party nomination for president. Abraham Lincoln, mostly well-liked among anti-slavery northerners, had made some of the most powerfully worded speeches against slavery of any politician at the time. And now, there was a chance that he and his cheekbones could become president. For the South, that would be too much. In the 1860 election, Lincoln's name didn't even appear on the ballot in 10 southern states. But much to their horror, when the final results came in, Lincoln had won by an electoral college landslide. Lincoln himself tried to calm their fear. How many times do I have to tell you I'm not going to take away your slaves? Yeah, right, honest Abe. We've had enough of you northerners. We're going to go form our own country. You can't do that. Why not? Well, if, if you had won the election, would it be okay for us to leave? Of course not. Well, why not? Because that's not how victim mentality works. Many states felt that when they joined the Union, they always withheld the right to leave it whenever they pleased. Many people living in 19th century America often felt more loyalty to their state than to the nation. And now, with the South feeling like it had lost its voice in the federal government, they were out of here. South Carolina was the first to go, and over a period of six months, one by one, 11 slave states officially seceded from the Union, with just four contested border states opting to remain. The seceding wow. states issued a number of official documents justifying their secession. South Carolina proclaimed that it was northern states' hostility to slavery that rendered the federal government illegitimate. Mississippi declared that their position was thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery. And in a speech, the Confederate vice president stated that the new Confederate government rested upon what he called the great truth of racial inequality. Revered American generals, such as Robert E. Lee, opted to side with their states over the Union. And with all the chaos, one New York lawyer wrote that rather than a bold eagle, America's national bird should be a debilitated chicken. And hey, I kind of like that. One man, watching the crisis unfold, knew it would be his job to solve it. Lincoln was just about to hop on a train and become the president of the United States of America. Hey man, you're hella ugly. Grow a beard or something to hide that face. Hmm. Good idea. Hmm? <laughs> eh, still ugly. With assassination plots already underway, Lincoln had to travel to Washington, D.C. under heavy disguise and protection. <laughs> All along the way, he received stacks of threatening letters. May the hand of the devil strike you down. You are destroying this country. Damn you, every breath you take. Love from 
Grandma? At his inauguration speech, Lincoln once again reiterated that no, I do not want to take away anyone's slaves. But for Lincoln, he did want to preserve the Union. He declared secession to be nothing but an illegitimate rebellion. In your hands and not in mine, he said, is the momentous issue of civil war. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. We are not enemies, but friends. It was clear Lincoln was ready and willing to get freaky and open up a can of Scatman John if he had to. Whether he had the support of the people, however, was in question. In the end, it was the Confederates that fired the first shot. As they seceded, the Confederate states began seizing federal U.S. property throughout the South. Off the coast of Charleston, South Carolina, was one such federal property, Fort Sumter, held by a measly, undersupplied U.S. force. The Confederate militia there demanded the fort surrender, a request which was quickly denied. And any <clears throat> This is so wild if you think about it. Like, like it became a country and it was a union as they referred to. And then it's like literally they're going to war with, with, the, with each other. their own country. They're like, like I'm out. Bye. Like you just, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. Yeah. You just, for me anyways, I cannot process it as easily because, you know, you just think of your country. You'd never go to war with your own people in your own country type thing. Yeah. I guess that happens in other places in the world um, where you have, you know, different sections of political of the political spectrum, mm -hmm. which were more extremists and they'll, you know, by any means necessary, try to do a, a takeover and, and yeah. you know, the... Well even in not that we went to war, but even in Canada, like Quebec wanted to leave Canada as part of the country mm -hmm. at one point. I don't know if they still do. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I can kind of understand, you know, that idea of there's so much disagreement in the culture that you have within that country that you don't even want to be a part of it, but to actually like now we're seeing them actually Total starting war. to shoot <laughs> at yeah, each other. Yeah, yeah. And we know, I know like there's a lot of people that died in this where I don't know how many, but um, it's just wild to see how the process, you know, like escalated. Over Cause time. I almost like forgot that they got to a military conflict because we, we focus so much on the governmental process yeah, and, and politics. seeing Abraham Lincoln trying to, to, you know, decipher between, uh, you know, the union as a whole and the individual states and what they wanted, even though it went against what he believed should yeah. be taking place. Trying to be like the middleman of, you know, like meeting people in the middle. Because the risk was so great yeah. of a civil war. And that's like the last thing that you would want to have happen as a leader of a country mm -hmm. is your own country starts eating itself basically. Yeah. Right. And it's so wild to think about the United States in this way. Like I understand, I guess now a little bit further why there's so much polarization on some issues Yeah, because it's been embedded in their DNA like for so long, like literally over a hundred years. Whereas, you know, in Canada where we grew up, that is not a part of our DNA yeah, as, uh, at all. Right. Yeah. So it's very, you know, hard for us to understand like, why are you guys out of your throats so much, right? Yeah. And why is there so much polarization? Yeah. Although now I am seeing much more of it in Canada, but it's not so much from the the roots that we're seeing yeah. here. Yeah, no, it's more of like the things that are arising in today's day and yeah. age. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. I find this very interesting too, because like I honestly, like I said, don't know any, I didn't really know anything about this aside from the North versus the South. So all these little intricacies, I feel like I'm going to need to watch this like three times to over to pick it all up. And this is the oversimplified I know. Version. The Confederate militia there demanded the fort surrender, a request which was quickly denied. And any remaining hope for a peaceful solution to the secession crisis probably then died when the Confederates did this. The Battle of Fort Sumter is considered to be the beginning of the American Civil War. Many of the Confederates there also considered it to be the end of the American Civil War. They hoped Old Abe would just sigh and say, okay, you win. Unfortunately for them, Lincoln actually said, you're about to get a roundhouse to the face. Lincoln sent out the call for 75,000 volunteers and men signed up in droves, hopeful for some adventure and good old fashioned F-U-N. In the new Confederate capital at Richmond, Virginia, Confederate President Jefferson Davis and his cheekbones had also sent out the call for 100,000 men. As ever, both sides hoped for a quick end to the war. Is it over yet? No, Jimmy, it's been one week. Is it over now? No. How about now? If you ask that one more time, I swear I will turn this army around and you'll all have to go back home to your wives and children. <laughs> But in particular, the South knew the conflict would pose a bit of a challenge. How can we expect to win with a population of only 5 million against 22 million in the North? 
If you count us four million slaves, you'd have nine million. Great idea. Hand these rifles out to old them. Wait a minute. <laughs> you almost had me there. The problem for Lincoln was that many of his top generals were getting old and were being a bit too cautious. The commanding general was a man named Winfield Scott, a veteran of the Mexican-American War. And by now, he was too fat to even mount a horse. Okay, chaps, we need to come up with a plan. Hit me. We could wait for the Confederates to come and apologize. Maybe we should all sit in a circle and discuss our feelings. Crossing the Delaware into New Jersey worked for me. Those are all terrible ideas. And you. Wrong video. Hey, I'm the greatest president in the history of this nation. Yeah, we'll see about that, dingus. Eventually, Lincoln's generals came up with a multi-pronged strategy. First, a blockade would cut off and starve the south of supplies by sea. Secondly, taking control of the Great Mississippi River would sever the south's economic artery while splitting it in two. And finally, a main Union force in the east would move south and take the Confederate capital, ending the war. Bada boom, bada bing. <laughs> Skirmishes began to break out across the nation, and the Union army in the east began to move south towards Richmond. Everything seemed to be going well until they reached Manassas, where they came upon a large Confederate force. It's almost like they were waiting for us. How did they know? As it turned out, spies in DC had sent a coded message to the Confederates warning of the invasion. Did you use NordVPN? What the heck is NordVPN? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. Secession, Fat Man, and the Union invasion into Virginia. The two sides encountered each other at Manassas and both geared up for the first major battle of the Civil War, the first battle of Bull Run. The Confederates rapidly brought in support by a rail and the two sides were about equal in numbers. However, they were also equally inexperienced. A large number of civilians also rode out by carriage from DC to picnic on the nearby hills and watch the excitement unfold. Nobody seemed to quite understand how destructive this war was going to be. The Union forces pulled a flanking maneuver to hit the Confederates on their left and the two sides fired on each other in rows. Farm families living in the area were forced to flee the fighting, including a man named Wilmer McLean. Hurry up, Martha! There's a war out here! The more you tell me to hurry up, the slower I will go! The Union force saw initial success pushing the Confederates back to Henry Hill, but one as of yet fairly unknown General Thomas Jackson had arrived, and he took a defensive position, standing firm like a stone wall, holding the Union army off, and finally sending them running back to Washington, D.C. With heavy casualties, the sobering reality of war hit both sides hard, and the North, having just lost the first major battle, had to face the serious prospect that they may not actually win this war. President Lincoln, General Jackson whipped us so hard, the Confederates are calling him Stonewall Jackson. Wait, that's why they're calling him that? Not because he looks like he ran face first into a stone wall? <laughs> Apparently not. Worse yet, the North had also lost the first major battle out West, giving away control of Southwest Missouri. All of this was terrible news for Abraham Lincoln, especially since many of his generals and cabinet already didn't have much respect for him. They felt he was incapable of running a war because he seemed a bit like your friendly old grandpa. He famously loved a long-winded story and a good pun. I've been so busy, my wife is missing me, but her aim is starting to improve. <laughs> but deep down, few realized he could also be incredibly shrewd. <laughs> oh, Abe, you're so funny. Funny how? Funny like I'm a clown? Uh. Babe, I was just... No, no. Funny how? Like I'm here to amuse you? During the war, Lincoln committed acts that were viewed by some as impeachable. His administration suppressed the free media from printing articles sympathetic towards the South. Some Southern sympathizers were even arrested without a trial. Lincoln's criticizers began accusing him of being a tyrant. But to quote the man himself, Hey, it's war, baby. What are you gonna do? By the end of 1861, with things already looking bad for the North, Abolitionists such as Frederick Douglass couldn't believe that the Union Army weren't enlisting black men. He continued to put pressure on Lincoln to make the war about emancipation. Mr. President, it's time to make the war about emancipation. Hmm, I don't want to ruffle any feathers. The feathers are already ruffled. But Lincoln, <laughs> hanging on to hope for a quick end to the conflict, continued to fight only for the preservation of the Union. It was decided, however, that escaped slaves from the Confederacy could be held as enemy contraband, and many of these men were put to work bolstering the Union's infrastructure and supply lines. Hoping to get things moving, Lincoln made young General George McClellan the new commanding general, and McClellan began to train up his men. He thought a lot of himself, however, and believed he was going to be the nation's great savior. And like many others, he didn't approve of the president's handling of the war. On one occasion, Lincoln went to McClellan's house to meet with him, but McClellan was late returning home. He kept the president waiting, and when he finally got there, he just straight up went to bed. Now that's what I call disrespectful. McClellan talked the talk, but could he walk the walk? No. Like Lincoln's other generals, McClellan was maddeningly cautious. 
Hey man, could you move south and attack the enemy? What? Are you crazy? What if they have a big scary army down there? They probably do. What? Oh my gosh! McClellan worried that he did not have the numbers he needed to fight effectively. What if they have like 10,000 men? Okay, no problem. We'll get you 20,000 men. Well, what if they have 30,000 men? I'll need 40. Okay, you can have 40. Well, what if they have 50? I'll need 60. Lincoln tried, but it was all in vain. McClellan would not make a move for the rest of the year. The North's one saving grace for now. So, I mean, a, a couple of points, and we'll get back into it. It's just the first one being, they touched on a little bit, and I feel like as things progress, they progress slowly, as we've, as we've already discussed and highlighted. And so when the war actually took place, even me watching it now, it's like surprising to see it. I feel like the people that were in that situation at that time that were taking part in the war, but were caught up in this, you know, uh, North-South political, you know, um, moral ideology and, and uh, debate about things probably didn't actually perceive this war was going to take place within the union as a whole. Yeah. Right. So they're not like, they're like, oh yeah, it's like not going to be that serious. Like, you know, as they were alluding to, it's just going to be a show of force by one or the other. And then we're going to move on. Not and like they, an actual war. And it just kind of kept spiraling and spiraling and spiraling. And yeah. then to the point that we just watched in Abraham Lincoln kind of having some issues in finding a general to uh, do what he wanted to do. Yeah. Um, it, they were making light of it and kind of being like, oh, this is too dangerous type He's thing. I don't want to. baby. I have a hard time believing that, to be honest. Like, I, I don't think maybe that's the case. It was so much that they were scared, quote unquote. I think it was probably they just had so much pushback in you know these people didn't want to do what abraham lincoln wanted to do because they didn't agree with what he wanted to do mm -hmm. so finding people that were going to do what he wanted to do from like on the same page and just like from gonna... such a controversial issue yeah. that had obviously divided the nation already yeah so he's he was probably having problems finding somebody he could place into his cabinet to do his bidding for him in that regard yeah from the standpoint of that they were opposed to him and what he wanted to do not so much that they were scared and that's kind of like i'm just theorizing in my own head here about you know how it would have played out because i have a hard time seeing you don't think they would have been scared after they literally just got their butts handed to them twice prior not really because i feel like if you're at war you're at war with it about an issue that you're really passionate about that you yeah. care about and so that's why you're literally at war to begin with right yeah and so either you believe in the cause or you don't and if you believe in the cause it's like no we can win this is important to us we have to win there's you know we, we need to make sacrifices that's going to be the you know probably the mentality that you're going to take with yeah, it that makes sense and on top of that they had more men right yeah they had way more men so yeah, it shouldn't have been a close if they had the right strategy and they had mm -hmm. you know the right, um, like leadership and stuff the right yeah the right leadership with the resources that they had they should have been fine to to win that uh, war right so there really wasn't a need to be scared it's not like the reverse right it should have been the confederates that were like worried about going to war because they're so severely outnumbered yeah right it's just weird to me though because it's like you know for any of like those potential situations is that like obviously like there's a, such a strong divide that it's like well how wouldn't you even have a trouble finding a general who's on the same page to want to go fight them because clearly everybody in the north was so against slavery and so against what but they were doing what in the south that's what I'm saying is that that's the that's the discussion that we're seeing here mm -hmm. is that the north was clearly uh, you know, on one side of the fence here, but whether there wasn't nuanced discussions and disagreements in the North, even, mm. I think we're probably not getting the True, full scope yeah, of that. True, because it's oversimplified. And that although we look at it now, we're like, yeah, okay, that was the right thing to do. You know, at the time, there would have been squabbling within your yeah, own you know, people that would have been saying, no, I don't agree with this. Why are you jeopardizing everything? Why are you tearing apart, apart our country? Like they've been saying some of the other lawmakers were discussing. It's like, no, I don't agree with what you're doing because yeah. you're going to cause everything to fall apart and you're going to ruin our country. Yeah, yeah. So it's not worth it. Right. And yeah. that's probably what we're seeing from that. So True. I think, you know, our commenters have said that 
some of these things they gloss over or they don't dive into enough that there's important to factors to consider yeah. and that it's it can be taken out of context from an oversimplified version we wouldn't understand that it wasn't as simple as the north and the south there was that yeah. there was complications like basically in the north from an oversimplified south. version or perspective he's just saying that this guy didn't go do what he was supposed to do so whatever right. reason that is it is whatever they're not diving into that he's just making comedic effect of the exactly. fact that this guy wouldn't go do what he was supposed to exactly. do exactly yeah but if they have 50, I'll need 60. Lincoln tried, but it was all in vain. McClellan would not make a move for the rest of the year. The North's one saving grace for now was a general out west fighting in Kentucky and Tennessee, General Ulysses S. Grant. Cool, collected, methodical, and a big fan of whiskey. His chief of staff took it upon himself to keep Grant sober. One officer said that Grant habitually wore an expression as though he were determined to drive his head through a brick wall and was about to do it. And that determination led him to score a number of key victories when others around him were failing. At the Battle of Fort Donelson, Grant was like, Why does Stonewall Jackson get a cool nickname and I don't? I want a cool nickname. Sir, the Confederates say they're ready to surrender and want to know your terms. No terms, just unconditional surrender. Hey, unconditional surrender Grant. That's a pretty cool nickname, right? Guys, right? Later in April 1862, the Confederates launched a sudden attack on Grant's army at Shiloh, but the determined, unconditional surrender Grant threw his lines at the rebels and sent them running. The battle resulted in the heaviest casualties in U.S. history so far. And despite his victory, Grant found himself under fire. You have to get rid of Grant. Why? Didn't he win? Yes, but he just threw his men at the enemy. Isn't that the point? Also, he's a loony drunk. Well, what does he like to drink? I believe whiskey, sir. Then send him more. Lincoln watched as his cabinet did nothing but bicker and his generals did nothing. But then, worst of all, personal tragedy struck. Lincoln's young son, Willie, very much loved by the president, died of typhoid fever at the age of 11. Lincoln was a sensitive man and was heavily affected by the loss. His wife was inconsolable. But one of Lincoln's greatest traits, what made him such a great leader, was in the darkest of times with composure and determination. He kept moving forward. He knew it was his responsibility to hold himself and his family together. And by doing so, he hoped to hold the nation together. And he had had it with McClellan's in action. Lincoln decided he was going to take control. In March 1862, Lincoln firmly ordered McClellan to once again move south towards Richmond. McClellan insisted instead they move by sea to the Virginia Peninsula and attack Richmond from the southeast. Yes, said Lincoln. Okay, anything. Lincoln held on to some of McClellan's men to defend D.C. from a nearby Stonewall Jackson wreaking havoc in the Shenandoah Valley, and he sent McClellan south. McClellan landed on the peninsula, and he began to move inland. He came up against a small Confederate army that had dug in at Yorktown. McClellan vastly outnumbered the force, but it's said that Confederate General Magruder deceived McClellan by cleverly maneuvering his smaller force and making McClellan believe he faced a huge army. No, you have way more men than them. Move forward. No. McClellan settled in for a month-long siege, giving time for Johnston to move south from Manassas and Magruder time to retreat. When he finally entered the city and found it deserted, he declared it a victory, calling his success brilliant. Then, after meeting some resistance at Williamsburg, McClellan moved to within just 20 miles of Richmond, his armies able to hear the church bells ringing in the enemy capital. You still outnumber them. Go give them hell. No. McClellan once again held back, moving slowly and defensively, and with his army split in two, the Confederates saw an opportunity to strike back. McClellan's advance was halted, and now the Confederates pulled an ace out of their sleeve. General Lee, you're up. Do you think we should evacuate Richmond? No, Mr. President, no need. General Robert E. Lee, one of the most brilliant military commanders of the time, was now in charge. One of his biggest strengths was his ability to read the mind of his enemy, and he knew McClellan was cautious and weak. After moving Stonewall Jackson before. south to join him, and even though he had a smaller army, Lee hit McClellan in a series of fast-paced, close combat battles that had McClellan spooked. McClellan retreated the Union army back again and again and again, escaping the peninsula and returning to DC. Lee had defeated wow. McClellan and the campaign had failed. Well, wow. that was a major success. A success? Tell me exactly what was successful about that. Well, we successfully retreated. You lost. I didn't lose. I merely failed to win. Things just kept looking worse for the North. At least their Navy had seen some success, capturing a number of key port cities, notably when they steamrolled past Confederate forts to take New Orleans. And speaking of the Navy, both sides had begun using ironclads. So that's pretty cool. But in the East, they still weren't having any luck. 
After McClellan's disastrous campaign, Lincoln briefly sent out one General John Pope to attack Northern Virginia. Hey man, just checking in. How's it going? Well, the Confederates kicked my butt at Cedar Mountain. Then they raided my camp and ran off with my money and clothes. Also, I appear to have been wedgied. Lee defeated Pope at yet another battle at Bull Run, in which nearby farm families once again got caught up in the fighting. Hurry up, Martha! There's another war out here! I'm waiting for my hair to dry! Wilmer McLean, sick of war, moved his family south, where he knew the war would definitely, absolutely, never touch him again. But Lincoln had yet another problem to contend with. European powers, in particular the UK, were looking increasingly like they may intervene diplomatically on the side of the Confederates. They were missing their precious supply of southern cotton because of the Union blockade, and they wanted to see a swift conclusion to the war. The tension between America and Great Britain had been increasing, especially after Confederate diplomats were discovered on a British ship. Now, after McClellan's failure to take Richmond, the UK declared it impossible for the North to win. Lincoln needed something to prevent Europe from getting involved, and after more petitioning from abolitionists, he decided maybe the time was finally right to make the war about ending the institution he hated, slavery. If the North had a noble cause to fight for, Europe would be less likely to intervene. But Lincoln and his cabinet knew before they could declare something as radical as emancipation, they needed a victory, especially now that the Confederates were about to go on the attack. Aware that he had a limited number of men and supplies, Lee now hoped that if he could just threaten Washington DC militarily, he would gain Europe's recognition and crush Northern morale in time for the midterm elections, forcing the North to negotiate. With confidence at an all-time high, for the first time, Robert E. Lee invaded the North. But on September 13th, the North finally had some luck. Oh boy, it's my lucky day! A cigar in a field! Hey, what's this wrapped around it? Oh my gosh! <laughs> That's right, the North had discovered General Lee's battle plans wrapped around some cigars, and in them, they saw that Lee had split up his forces. McClellan headed out from DC, and the two sides met in the Battle of Antietam, a crucial battle that would decide the course of the war. It saw the most vicious fighting to date, and still remains the single bloodiest day in American history. Wow. But for once, the North came out victorious, and Lee was forced to retreat. He's on the run. Chase him down and finish him off. No. You know what, old buddy, old pal? You're fired. The North had won their crucial victory. Lincoln breathed a huge sigh of relief, and with that win, he was prepared to take a huge step. On September 22nd, the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. In January, all slaves held in the Confederate States would be, as far as the US government was concerned, officially free. Throughout the North, free black men and women rejoiced, knowing that if the North were to win, their brothers and sisters would no longer be held in bondage. The proclamation also had the intended effect on Europe, who were not willing to oppose a pledge to end slavery. An outraged Confederacy knew that Lincoln had given the war a new meaning. It was no longer just about the preservation of the Union. Now, it was about creating a new Union, washed clean of its original sin. A Union without slavery. That was part one, the American Civil War. So much in just part one. That's crazy. It's also crazy that it took that long for them to even involve slavery into like the meaning behind the war. I mean, I'm sure like some of the, the negativity and the festering of the opposition came from that initially, but it's like, I'm surprised like why he didn't just do that from the beginning. Yeah. I mean, I found it surprising when they talked about the Europe potential for Europe to be involved yeah. because... Like, I would find that hard to see. I mean, of course, they mentioned that they had their own gain again. Individuals had their own gain. and and But from I what I understand, that Britain had already advanced beyond slavery at that point, right? Yeah. So, well, I think that's why they said they didn't want to get involved right, after. Right. So I would have a hard time seeing Britain even having any involvement at all because of that reason, even if there were individuals or, you know, certain sections of Britain that were experiencing economic hardship like how would that have worked i feel like that's i would need more information as to yeah dive know, a little bit deeper into that yeah because it seems a little far-fetched for me to for britain to get involved in america in an american war like that's pretty crazy to think that, yeah. that if it was a possibility that is crazy if it yeah. is a little bit you know stretching the truth we'll say um then uh, you know that's something i probably would would believe but Anyways, I think, you know, you're say, like you were highlighting that um, that proclamation they were referring to um, 
the people that were free in the North now potentially taking part in the war. Yeah. Right. So that's the big change is like, you know, it, now we're going to enlist you in the fight as well. So it's, it's clearly now become like everybody's joined together to fight for this cause against slavery to free the slaves of the South. So before yeah. that, prior to that, it was just, I believe, you know, um, the Northern military presence that didn't include uh, anybody that was black. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like, I guess from me and looking at this, obviously like in hindsight, it's 2020 and looking at it from an outsider perspective, but to me, like making it about ending slavery gives it such a stronger purpose for people other than just like fighting to stay a nation. Yeah. Especially with people who obviously don't even want to be a part of your nation. Yeah. But I think what you need to think through is that that was the, process of allowing people to participate in the military for the u.s mm-hmm. was a, a major step in providing rights to those people that were already granted freedom yeah but they weren't granted the right to participate in, in the, the united war. states military so to speak yeah right so it wasn't as easy at that point just yet to say you know we're all together and we're all going to do this it was like that was the next step in the process before we could say that yeah clearly we're all we're just against slavery yeah in order to be fully against slavery we had to have the emancipation proclamation to allow you us to get to, to this point and then the point of the war is clear clarified as to what yeah. you highlighted but prior to that slavery. it was we're still separate in this black and white dynamic of or slaves versus non-slaves that we're not entirely there yet so it was still a developing process even in the north and that's what i think we're seeing true anyways this is a long (laughs) enough video guys so we'll get to part two uh if you uh enjoyed this make sure you like it hit the comments and uh, make sure you come around for part two which will be dropping soon thanks for sticking with us we're not going to make anything off this video because the copyrights get claimed and all that so if you want to contribute and make a donation to the channel there's a paypal link below we appreciate all the support that you guys give us thank you so much we'll see you in our next video thanks for watching guys see you then